Peter, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Um, so you're one of the uh, most uh, renowned scholars on uh, affirmative action in the United States, and you come at it from an empirical perspective, that of, of an economist who studies the actual reality and impact that affirmative action is having in the country, or at least used to have, before the recent Supreme Court ruling. So perhaps let's just start with a very basic question also, because while most of our listeners are in the United States, we have a good chunk of an international audience. Um, what does the system of affirmative action, what did the system of affirmative action actually look like before the recent court ruling? And how extensive were preferences for racial minorities? How much of a difference did they actually make in terms of who got admitted to colleges? Well, there's a lot there. So first of all, it brings right to what makes the U.S. pretty different, which is that we have holistic admissions. And that, in part, uh, you know, was put in initially to discriminate against the Jews um, because they were doing too well on the academic front. But it really got reinforced by the Supreme Court decisions, uh, particularly in the two Michigan cases. So in, in those two Michigan cases, um, at the undergraduate level, they found it was unconstitutional what they were doing. And that was that you, they had an explicit point system. You got so many points for your SAT score, so many points for being of a particular race. They said, you can't do that. What you have to do is consider it as part of their whole person review. Now, from any, and that was what was found to be legal on the law school side. Now, the irony is, is that affirmative action was actually much more and, and, aggressive and one of the, one, on the law school side. And one of the parts, and, and one of the parts of that ruling, if I uh, understand it, is also that they only allowed a particular kind of justification for affirmative action, right? I mean, uh, coming at this from a normative perspective, in, in my mind, the, the strongest justification for some form of affirmative action in the United States is specifically tied to historical injustice and some desire to rectify it. Given the exactly. reality of slavery and Jim Crow, um, you know, I, it would indeed be troubling if today Harvard and Yale and Stanford only had a tiny number of black students. So, so I see the sort of compelling justification for some form of rectificatory justice there. The one of the interesting things about that court case was that it sort of rejected that premise and, and plunked for the slightly different um, uh, uh, sort of permissible grounds of diversity and the idea that universities could try to create this diverse student experience to somehow improve learning outcomes, which in my mind had sort of these two really troubling effects. The first is that it sort of makes minority students a means to an end rather than them being there in some way for their own gain, but sort of there to create the overall atmosphere that is helpful to the student body in, 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 in a way that I think is sort of, um, I don't know whether it would, I'm not a Kantian, I don't quite believe in, 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 in Immanuel Kant's um, uh, universal maxim, but universalizable, universalizable maxim, but, but I think it would pass a kind of Kantian, te- fail a kind of Kantian test, right? I mean, the second problem with it, of course, is that it completely untethered the reality of historical injustice in the United States from how diversity actually plays out, such that today um, the numbers aren't exactly known, but something like 40%, perhaps 50% of black students at Ivy League universities have recent African ancestry, so they're not actually That's right. of slaves, and we don't actually... Uh, have an experience of injustice. So, so just to explain that sort of the, the role that that co- ruling played, because it was it was rejecting the the sort of specific points for ethnicity, but it was also sort of it, you know really the beginning of this American discourse of diversity um, comes in part from that Supreme Court ruling, as I understand it. That's right, and it basically created a whole academic literature designed to show the benefits of diversity in order to justify the affirmative action, which was really the reason people were supporting it was for reparations. And you're totally right. It, it disproportionately favors recent immigrants um, and uh, those from more wealthier families. It's disproportionately uh, you know, biracial. And even the way the preferences operate, you know, it favors the advantaged uh, African-Americans much more than the disadvantaged ones. And now what you're bringing up about dealing with the the legacy of discrimination in our country. Part of me feels like with affirmative action, it was a band-aid that allowed you to cover it up because we're able to say, look, 
Harvard looks racially representative, everything's okay. But when our school systems have fundamentally failed African Americans, our society has fundamentally failed African Americans to the point where, you know, one percent of African Americans get above a thirteen ninety on the SAT, eight percent of whites and twenty five percent of Asian Americans, you're already at a big disadvantage. And, and so let's get into, you know, what the system actually was. Let's say to begin with at the undergraduate level, and then we can get a little bit to the, to the graduate level. So the polling on affirmative action is kind of complicated. Uh, it depends a lot on exactly how you ask the questions. But, you know, roughly speaking, I think there's a little bit of sympathy, perhaps not from a majority of U.S. population, but from a very significant chunk of U.S. population to say universities should, should do all these efforts to increase uh, diversity to to increase representation of of ethnic minorities, perhaps you know about half of Americans are in favor of that playing some role in admissions, but they certainly don't think it should play a decisive role. So so in reality, at 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 at, at Harvard, at Stanford, at Duke, where where you teach, at 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 sort of some of the more selective colleges around the country, um, how big a factor? was raised so far? Was it that sort of small thing that would tip an application over, over the edge or was it, did it make a more fundamental difference? Oh, it may, makes a huge difference. And I think what's happened is, is as universities get more and more selective over time, you see that the preferences you have to give have to be bigger and bigger. Uh, we actually saw that on the legacy side too, where it would start off, you know, legacies might be twice as likely to get in as non-legacies. And now we're at the point where it's more like four to five times uh, as likely to get in. On the African-American front in particular, so racial preferences are largest for African-Americans. Um, and then they're, you know, about half the size for Hispanics. We're talking about um, two thirds to three quarters of African-American admits at Harvard would not get in absent the racial preferences. So that's a stunning share. And what's remarkable about that is that's Harvard. If you look, you know, the UNC case, there that, that was also part of this, and it gets virtually no attention. UNC is really interesting because they have out-of-state and in-state admissions, and out-of-state is way harder to get in. The, what UNC faces is that their top black applicants who might have applied to UNC out of state, they get into Harvard. So n nine out of 10 African-American admits from out of state would not have been admitted absent the racial preferences. So it's, a, it's really a stunning number. But, you know, this idea of it being a Band-Aid I'm telling you the, all these huge numbers. This is operating at the elite schools. You know, most students actually go to not selective schools. Um, and affirmative action fundamentally affects where people go to college, not whether they go to college. So a lot of schools are actually going to see more diversity as it trickles down from the people who would have gone to Harvard. Well, they're just going to shift and go to you know, a school further down. So this is the case that, um, you know, a, a black student who may have gotten into the flagship state university in the state they're from because of affirmative action goes to Harvard. And the student who would have gone to a good state university within the state now goes to the flagship state university. Um, there's been a big debate about whether that's beneficial to those students, whether the fact that they end up getting into a higher quality school, which presumably is better at creating educational and career opportunities, uh, presumably allows people to build a more powerful network, whether that is to the benefit of our students or whether the so-called mismatch theory is right, where, um, for example, a student who may intend to major in, in, in pre-med and, and, and go off to medical school and become a doctor, ends up being at a school where they're competing with students uh, who are better prepared, um, 
and 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 perhaps have 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 stronger academic foundations and therefore end up dropping out of that path. But perhaps actually the ambition to become doctors would have been better served at a school that has a broader range of preparation and perhaps ability than at the very top schools. Talk us a little bit uh, uh, through that debate and, and your position on it. I, I mean, yes, I think that's, you've actually hit on exactly why I took this case in the first place. Because everyone talks about affirmative action. They know that it, race plays a role. But they never knew how much. And for me, when we think about affirmative action in that regard, there ought to be an optimal amount. I think everybody actually believes that if you go too far, you're going to have some mismatch, at least in some areas. And the question is, where is that point? A little bit of affirmative action. Everybody wants to go to a school that's a little bit better than they are, and that's going to benefit you. At some point, though, you can be pushed so far that you can have negative consequences. And those negative consequences will really depend on what you want to study. So it matters a lot more in STEM fields. And the reason for that is STEM fields build upon your, your previous preparation. That, that it's impossible to get anything below a B plus in a humanities or social science subject at American elite schools. Sorry, that is. A, well, a, that is I'm the case. Joking. And um, and what's remarkable about that is, from an economist's point of view, that emerges because of supply and demand. Lots of people come in wanting to major in STEM courses because that's where the money is. And universities effectively allow these other departments to bribe them to leave those fields. And they do that by offering them uh, higher grades and lower workloads. And the irony is that, you know, I have another paper on this that actually really hurts women because women tend to value grades more than men. So you could actually do something to close the STEM gap just by saying, look, we need to equalize grades across fields. Um, you know, why should it be the case of, that it's so much easier to get a good grade in a humanities course than a science course? It's, I don't think it's actually that way in high school where you're captive, everyone has to take those courses. Um, so, you know, all that to say in the sciences, it really matters. You know, I teach at Duke, it, the, the economics class I teach, we're using multivariable calculus all the time. I went to Willamette University in Salem, Oregon, small liberal arts school. There was no calculus in the major at that time. A person who might not do so well in my class, ended up switching out, might have been done just fine at uh, Willamette. And I think that's the other thing, because, it, you know, if you look at like the college scorecard data, it's very clear. And I've written papers on this as well. Your major matters. And I think it actually matters more than the quality of the school that you go to. Now, that's, of course, an on, an on average statement. It's not going to be true across the board. But, um, you know, being a, a computer science major at NC State is going to be much better than being a history major at UNC. Um, so tell us through the empirical evidence here. So I, I take it that you are on the side of the debate that says that uh, there has empirically been a significant mismatch in the United States for the past decades, that um, uh, there have in fact been negative consequences for many students or on average uh, for, for students who, who, who benefited from affirmative action, or you can, you can qualify exactly uh, sort of the right magnitude here um, as a result of, uh, uh, of a mismatch resulting from strong practices of affirmative action. Talk us through why we should believe that. What's the evidence on your side? And, 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 and what would your critics say? How would you respond to the people within that debate who disagree with your conclusion? So I think that um, it depends, again, on what outcome you're looking at. So, you know, for the STEM majors, it's going to come up. But even there, you see some papers argue that it's not. That's not true. I can't get past, of course, some of my own work, which, you know, at Duke, the numbers were crazy. At Duke, um, once you condition on gender, 
uh, African Americans were more likely to want to major in STEM and economics than whites by just a little bit. But they switched out at a way higher rate. And so there was actually a protest back in 2011 over one of my papers on this. And it really, I view the protest over a combination of the data fact to me not knowing how to talk in a politically correct manner. But, you know, over 50% of African American men who started in STEM and economics switched out. 8% of white men switched out. And once you conditioned on differences in academic background, that all went away. So it was not that the sciences were like, oh, you're black, get out of here. Except that that was being done through the fact that the preparation matters and they're coming in with much worse preparation, both because of affirmative action and because of, of what's happened prior to college. And, and so how do we know that if these students who were hoping to be pre-med students or computer engineering students or economic students um, and then ended up uh, struggling academically and switching out to easier majors like the ones I teach, um, political science, um, uh, how do we know that if these students had gone to a lower ranked uh, a school, uh, let's say a, a non-flagship school in, in North Carolina, um, or if they had gone, let's say, to 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 an HBCU, to a historically black college or university that specializes in uh, students who often, you know, come from less advantaged high schools and, and have less academic preparation, but 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 really has a tradition of of helping them uh, become doctors and, and and lawyers and so on. How do we know that they would have fared better in those schools? I don't think we fully know. I think that we can make some assumptions on it. There's one paper by Zachary Bleemer who sort of argues that there are, um, that minority students lost out as a result of removing affirmative action in California. So, sort of two comments about that paper. The first is that's not dealing with the optimal amount of affirmative action. That's moving from not having it uh, to having it. There's a number of concerns with the with the paper, but one of the things to point out is that when he says that after uh, racial preferences were removed, uh, earnings for underrepresented minorities went down in California. That result is completely driven by Hispanics. You don't see any effect on the earnings for black students. Well, why does that matter? Black students are getting the biggest preferences. That's that shows that they'd cross that point where, you know, they're n they're now not getting those benefits that went that far. If black students had been given the preferences that Hispanic students had gotten, maybe it would have been a win. Some affirmative action has always got to be better than no affirmative action for um, the group that it's helping. Um, so. So far, we've been talking about undergraduate admissions, and it's interesting that uh, actually not. I'll, I'll come back to that question. Um, uh, so, uh, one of the things that you've already alluded to is the effect that affirmative action is having on uh, schools towards the middle of the distribution, right? So, um, as I understand it, uh, you know, part of what happens through affirm affirmative action is that uh, uh, you know. Students who would have ended up at, at pretty good schools end up going to very, very good schools. Um, uh, students who struggle academically, who, 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 who just about make it to community college, who make it to non-selective colleges, sort of stay in that range of schools. Uh, so, so how does that affect uh, a sort of a large number of schools across the United States that are somewhat selective, but are sort of in the middle of a distribution? Yeah, I think you're going to see on the one hand, they're going to pick up students from those who have previously gotten into those top schools. And then on the other hand, they lose out on some of the students that would have gone there. But what's interesting about that is it really changes the academic backgrounds of their minority students. So if the number of minority students actually stays the same, I think it's actually going to be very good for that school. And the reason is, is because now they so, have... So, sorry, Peter, I think... Sorry, Peter, I think you're framing it around what what impact the 
court ruling is going to have, but I, I oh. was still framing it around what, 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 what was true in the previous system, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, uh, there just just i mean you say just, it's basically just saying the same thing but in the inverse way right i just That's worry right. that I so was unc going, loses out on affirmative act because harvard and duke practice affirmative action they lose those minority students who would have been a great fit for unc um and, and there are other aspects to that in terms of you know coming back to actually the benefits of diversity to the extent that there are benefits of diversity, I think it really matters if people are coming in with more similar academic backgrounds. So so some of my work's been on you know well how would you ever measure this and we're looking at cross racial friendships, and if you end up so far apart on things like SAT score, it's not like people are going around with SAT scores on their heads, but fundamentally. You know, you sort into study groups, you sort into classes, and then you end up in a, in a more segregated environment um, when you have very aggressive affirmative action policies. Oh, that's fascinating. I had never heard this point before. So, so the argument here, just to draw it out a little bit, is that there's homophily. This is probably the most stable um, uh, research finding in sociology in the last hundred years. Like attracts like. Um, one dimension might be might be racial, racial or cultural, but there's lots of dimensions of similarity. And so students of a similar strength might naturally gravitate towards each other in class. They might take more similar classes, be exposed to each other in that kind of way. And so if you have uh, members of different uh, ethnic groups more closely academically matched, there's going to be m many more friendships between those groups. Whereas if you're in an environment where because of affirmative action, those groups are less matched than they otherwise might be, it actually might be driving segregation, or some amount of segregation on college campuses. Did, did I understand that argument right? That's exactly right. And what's amazing is, you know, one of my studies actually showed if you look at the share of same race friends that black students have in high school, it looks about the same as the share of same race friends in college, but it should have been much uh, lower share same race in college because the, the share of black students is much smaller in their colleges they're attending than in their high schools. And so once you account for that, college is actually leading to less mixing than high school. That's a, to me stunning because, you know, in college, we don't have the housing segregation. Well, we might, but that might be a feature of the program as well. But in high school, you know, segregated neighborhoods, um, those types of things would would affect that. And the colleges advertise themselves as places where this mixing is going to occur. That is that is really interesting. Um, so 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 far we've been. Look, one of the things I'm struck by in this debate is that um, you know because needy old journalists at top outlets in the United States where <laughs> undergraduates in top universities. You know, the debate is needy exclusively about what happens at the top universities. And because every parent is obsessed with getting the kid into uh, a good college of a certain social class, at least, um, you know, undergraduate admissions loom much larger than, than graduate admissions. Um, so we discuss much less admission to also very influential institutions like law schools and medical schools and uh, so on. What does all of that end up looking like at the post undergraduate level? What did it look like before the Supreme Court ruling? Well, certainly for law school, we, we've had some good data on that. But even then, universities don't like you looking at their data. Uh, and there, it's clear law school admissions, in my view, are actually very formulaic. Um, and, uh, you know, if you look at a combination of your uh, LSAT scores and your grades and form sort of like a ranking based on that. At the University of Michigan Law School, uh, the median black admit in terms of that combination of LSAT scores and grades would fall at the second percentile of the white distribution. So, you know, they're coming in, it, it is a feature that you would be so, at so near the bottom of the class. What do you mean by, by, by the second percentile would mean that 98% of white admits, according to what you're saying, would have stronger academic backgrounds than the median black admit? 
Exactly. And, you know, where that matters, I mean, there was that case at Georgetown where that uh, instructor was caught on video lamenting the poor performance of her black students. And the video is a little cringy, but, you know, the university decried it as racist and everyone said, look, this this is horrible. We need to reevaluate everything. But the reality is we, we actually have data on this. That is a feature of affirmative action. You know, affirmative action may still be better for your long run outcomes, but it cannot be better for you in terms of your class rank. You know, it's by definition, you're moving yourself up with the, with stronger peers. So your class rank has to, has to fall. Um, and that's part of my issue with affirmative action is, you know, I think it can, those students at Georgetown, they were getting big bumps for their race and they come out of Georgetown thinking the system is racist. And that's because universities are so dishonest with how the policies work. And you can see that in the Supreme court debate, you know, Justice Jackson talking about race being a factor of a factor, like it, like the tie, like it's a tiebreaker. It's, it's not a tiebreaker and universities just don't want to say that because they don't want to hurt people's feelings. Uh, but that has negative consequences. So, so let me play devil's advocate for a moment here. So, <clears throat> you know, we were talking the undergrad context. This is a mismatch problem, right? Um, that students who have this ambition to become lawyers or doctors uh, end up less likely to be able to fulfill their dream and to have a kind of career and life that they wish for because they end up being overselected into university where it's more competitive and so on. Now, if I'm being slightly cynical, I might say, well, but if in the next step down the line, law schools and medical schools also have these very aggressive affirmative action procedures, in fact, affirmative action procedures that might be more aggressive than at the undergraduate level, um, then actually the students might not be harmed in terms of their career path. And if then uh, there's sort of a system of affirmative action that goes uh, uh, on above the uh, uh, postgraduate level as well, if you also see some elements of that and in hiring practices and residencies for medical school or, uh, you know, hiring for, for law firms and, and, and whatever other kinds of positions or prestige and influence there might be in the society, then the sort of consistent chain of uh, uh, strong forms of affirmative action might in fact create the, 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 the kind of thriving uh, uh, middle and upper middle class of uh, people from ethnic minority backgrounds that uh, you might wish for even on the kind of reparations uh, justification, which I think is a stronger justification than the than 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 the diversity one. Now, um, you know, obviously, that might also come with all kinds of negative effects. Um, uh, it, it might come, for example, if you think that in certain fields of the economy or of professions, it just matters how 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 uh, 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 able people are. It may lead to um, less good outcomes in some important metrics, or it might lead to the kind of social tension that might come from certain forms of mismatch or other kinds of things. But in a way, it's sort of, you know, one of those things where it, it, if you just keep doing it consistently, some of these problems might paradoxically be remedied. And I think you're right on that. I think that what tends to happen, you know, take the law, the law example, uh, research has sort of shown look, affirmative action definitely happens on the lawyer side. And so you're getting that one step up, but it happens um, at the right out of law school level. When you become a partner, they're not going to, they're not going to do that as much. And so university, you know, schools are sort of looking for uh, law firms, I should say, they're always looking for the cheapest way to satisfy diversity pressures. And so the easiest way to do that is to hire the rookies but then not make them partner. Now, that being said, I think you've hit on something that also, you know, in the past, they would have said the last place where you'd want to do affirmative actions in medical school, you know, lives are at stake in that regard. And I think Justice Jackson, Jackson's been sort of really criticized for what she said about that particular aspect. But, you know, one of the, issues on the race front is that if a white doctor gives a script for a black patient to follow, 
the black patient is much less likely to follow it than if it's given from a black doctor. So that would be an example of a case where, you know, you have a group that distrusts uh, the instructions that they're getting. Um, we might be concerned about that. One way of fixing that would be with the affirmative action angle. But the other part to it, and I think that this is the whole, to me, the best argument for affirmative action is trying to rebuild trust um, in society. You know, that fundamentally, I actually think things are, are not so bad, but because people believe that they're so bad, it ends up having really uh, negative consequences. You know, I, you know, I don't think that uh, people, uh, affirmative action is a great example of that. I think whites believe affirmative action is much more aggressive than it is. And African-Americans believe it's much less aggressive than it is. And that fits in with, you know, sort of how you see how racist society uh, is. So one element of all of this that we haven't talked about was at the heart of uh, the lawsuit in which you served as an expert witness. And that's what we've sort of talked mostly so far about white applicants and uh, African-American applicants, to some extent Hispanic applicants. Uh, but of course, one of the uh, uh, paradoxical features of the system has been that uh, it has really made it harder for Asian Americans to be admitted uh, to colleges, to, to graduate schools, and so on. Now, um, the number of Asian Americans in those institutions is overproportional relative to their share of the population, as it was for Jews in, in, in the mid-20th century. Um, but it does seem like uh, these institutions are concerned about becoming, quote-unquote, too Asian. And so as a result, they end up really raising admissions uh, criteria and standards for Asian Americans, e even over and above uh, what they are for, for for white Americans. So perhaps you can talk us a little bit through the evidence specifically of uh, those forms of discrimination against Asian Americans. Yes, to me that was uh, a pretty big shock because, you know, the, the data... We just don't have very much data on what's happening. And so to be able to actually test whether Asian Americans be discriminated against, given the size of their racial group, you, you typically don't have that. But with the Harvard data, you can. And what you see is that Asian Americans sort of lose out across the board. They lose out to whites through legacy and athlete preferences. They lose out to Hispanics and African Americans because of racial preferences. And they lose out to whites, just like you said, because of what I view as discrimination. And the way that that operates is, is in a few ways. Uh, this, the first is just, you know, taking Harvard's criteria as given. They, you know, they rank them lower on the personal score. Um, and there's no real good explanation uh, uh, for that. The, um, and what's amazing, like to me, you couldn't have had more compelling evidence on that regard. So Harvard gives you a, a ranking on a, a personal rating. But there's actually another personal rating in the data as well, because um, most applicants get interviewed by um, alumni and the alumni uh, give you a personal rating, too. And one of the big differences is that the alumni interviewer, they actually meet you. Uh, and so through that meeting, you can overcome those stereotypes. If you had told me before looking at the data, where would discrimination occur? it would be among the alumni interviewers. These are the ones who haven't had the diversity training. They've got the, all the legacy cultural norms about, you know, how do you talk about these things? And, you know, there's a little bit of evidence for that, but it's nothing in comparison to what you see from the admissions officers. And so I think what happens is, is that implicitly you end up doing something along the lines of making in race comparisons. And that really makes uh, Asian Americans not look so good because there's so many. And so, you know, um, yeah, you know, one case in particular haunted me throughout because I actually read a bunch of these files. And so I can only talk, you know, basically in my reports, I reported lots of quotes on this and Harvard had like all of them redacted, but, during trial, I, I testified on one, so I can share one story, 
you know, and this was an Asian American woman who, um, you know, spent time in foster care. His dad had a severe mental illness, got hit by a drunk driver the summer before her applications. I mean, crazy stuff happened to this person. And, you know, she talked about it in her essays. The letter writers talked about her. And all the only comment that the admissions officer wrote on her file was SS. And SS means standard strong or good, but not good enough. And this candidate got like the normal score on the personal rating, the one that everybody sort of gets, unless you distinguish yourself. The alumni interviewer said, this is one of the best interviews I've ever had and was so impressed with all that this person has overcome. So to me, it's like you, you have an expectation of, when, when you're reading that file, this this uh, Asian American has to wow me in a way that someone from another race would not. And, and so, talk me a little bit more through the through the technical details here, because I think it's it's, it's really interesting and and quite disturbing. Um, you know, let me let me let, let, let me say something a little bit broader before we go into the details here. Something that I'm always struck by in politics is our ability to ignore the suffering or the injustice that is politically inconvenient. Um, this is a very far field comparison that, you know, we don't, we don't like to think about the suffering of people in North Korea, not because we have some particular sympathy for the North Korean regime, but because we know that we can't do anything about the suffering of people in North Korea. It's a nuclear power. There's nothing we can do. So it's inconvenient to think about, uh, you know, tens of millions of people just living under horrific conditions. Um, you very strongly have the instinct to not think about a particular injustice if it calls into question a, a a practice or a system that you think is just for other reasons, right? So I think that, you know, I'm sure that's true of things where I have a strong instinct that something is just, and it's just easier not to look at the sort of slightly unfortunate things from that, right? Like I'm a believer in meritocracy. Perhaps it's, you know, tempting not to look too closely um, at 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 what it means for people who are less talented to live in a deeply meritocratic society. Right? Um, I think for, you know, I can understand the case for affirmative action. Um, uh, 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 I, I, I feel the pull of it. I feel ambivalent about it, but I feel the pull of it, right? I can, I can see why, given America's history, it would feel uh, 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 deeply unjust and monstrous to have these elite college campuses with very few black students in particular. Um, but I do think it creates this incredibly strong pull that you see throughout the media and throughout academia and throughout the way we talk about it to not look at the un sort of unfortunate parts of a practice as it has existed. And when it comes to Asian Americans, and I wrote this was my one of my first op in the New York Times many years ago while I was still a graduate student at Harvard, you know, the, the extent to which we've normalized and tolerated just straight up discrimination against Asian Americans in particular it's just disturbing to me. And, 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 and so I think it's just worth dwelling on it for a moment. So, so as I understand this personal rating system, right? So, so you have this holistic review, in quotation marks, and, and, and it has all these different kinds of factors of, of what's going into it and what's going on. And as I understand it, you know, you have the alumni interviews at which the personality rating that these uh, alumni give to Asian American applicants perhaps are a smidgen below the personality ratings that they give to other race applicants. You have uh, objective information about things like, uh, you know, how many, and I don't think these are great criteria for college admissions, but they're common criteria for college admissions. How many clubs have you been president of in your high school? And how many sports teams have you been on? And how many, whatever medals have you won? And Asian American applicants, as I understand it on those, are as good or better than other race applicants at the, at, at, at the top schools. And then you have this personality rating that these admissions officers that have never met these students um, attach to their applications after sort of reading through the files. And tell us a little bit about the, the magnitude of difference there. I remember some figure from, from something I read a while ago, but I, I mean, I may be getting it wrong, but, but I remember it just being standards of deviation lower than the personality ratings for non-Asian students. I mean, really just sort of, you know, what basically what Harvard University is implicitly saying in a very non-public way, and they didn't want to make those things public, is the average Asian applicant to our school 
has a way, way shittier personality than applicants of any other race. Is it, 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 am, am, am I getting this broadly right, Peter? Yes. There is one other rating that they don't do as well on, which it's stunning that Harvard even has this, but they have an athletic rating. Um, and Asian Americans do the worst on that as well. The people who do the best on that are white legacies. And that's because it's sort of might you be able to walk on the sailing team type of thing. But you're right. Uh, you and, and, the athletic, and by the way, I, I believe if I'm if I'm right that Harvard introduced the athletic rating specifically to limit the intake of Jews in in the mid twentieth century, is that right? That would not surprise me, but I don't I don't have a site for that, so I don't I don't I don't know. On the personal rating, you definitely see these gaps. It's especially big for between Asian Americans and African Americans, and that's where you can sort of see it being used as a way of also putting in racial preferences. What's interesting about the personal rating is, you know, if you're black, you get a big bump on it. If you're poor, you get a bump, but not a, not a, uh, not as big. But if you're black and poor, you don't get the poor bump. And so it's really, a, and that holds true in admissions as well, which to me sort of shows that this pattern of using it to get the types of students that you want you know, affirmative action fundamentally benefits non-poor uh, black black applicants. And the thing is, is, you know, relative to whites, you could say, look, we know that African-Americans, they're experienced a lot. So to the extent that the personal rating is supposed to be overcoming hardship, they're going to score better. But when you compare them to white Asian Americans, you can't make that argument. It is true that Asian Americans have now come from higher incomes than whites on average. It's not that different, but, but it is higher, but not among Harvard applicants. And the reason is, is because poor Asian families prepare their kids to apply to Harvard at a much higher rate than poor white families. So that, I mean, that it was stunning to me how well that group is doing, um, you know, uh, academically and on these other measures because so, extracurriculars they were beating whites as well yeah i'm just to say one you know one more thing about this i remember being in uh actually let, let, let's let it go um uh, uh, da, 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 uh so, so we've been talking a lot about what the system actually looked like um so the natural question is uh you know there's been this ruling um uh, by the Supreme Court, which basically says uh, affirmative action uh, in its current form violates the Equal Protection Clause, um, and 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 it has to go. Um, at the same time, uh, the ruling seemed to have opened a kind of loophole uh, because the justices said, "Well, of course, universities remain at liberty to consider." Uh, the kind of experiences people have had in their lives, including uh, experiences of, of racial injustice, and the way that that might have influenced the specific uh, qualities of character um, in, 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 in deciding how to admit students. And so um, I, 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 I guess I'm wondering what your prediction is about how big the impact of this ruling is actually going to be. Um, I'm sort of skeptical for two reasons. The first is that I know from uh, many of my friends and colleagues in academia who have served on admissions committees, on hiring committees, in all kinds of different contexts, that routinely uh, elite American universities engage in practices that by pre-existing Supreme Court law, I do. That, for example, they <laughs> effectively keep separate lists for uh, uh, applicants to certain uh, uh, positions of uh, minority ethnic groups, which, which, which would, as I understand it, have been illegal even before the Supreme Court ruled. So it's unclear to me whether universities are actually going to follow uh, uh, the law to a sufficient extent to make a very large difference. And the other reason is that it seems to me very clear that universities are now uh, pushing in the direction of making personal statements much more important. Many universities have already uh, said that it will not require SATs uh, or some of the graduate level equivalents for admission to graduate schools. Um, 
And it seems to me that universities that are strongly motivated to to keep up parts of the system um, uh, will simply move towards uh, saying, well, actually, we really, you know, the personal statement really is the most important thing that we look at, and thereby they're going to follow the letter of the Supreme Court ruling, even if they don't follow the spirit of it, and at least at first, try to keep as much of the practice as possible. So to put my cards on the table here, um, I'm ambivalent about affirmative action uh, in itself. I have strong feelings about the overall American admission system. Um, you know, I, I think that the whole system from uh, racial preferences, preferences for athletes, preferences for children of alumni, preferences for faculty members, for children of faculty members, uh, preferences for children of big donors, um, you know, preferences for people who are great at American football or great at playing bassoon. The whole damn thing to me is just a baroque, corrupt, unfair system. And so I would wish for university presidents to say, now we have an opportunity to, bear, to burn the whole damn system down. And uh, I'm not burned down the system kind of a guy. There's very few aspects yeah. of societies that for all of their injustices also uh, are relatively peaceful and create a lot of affluence and, and, and you know, allow people to live in relative liberty, where my instinct is to say, burn it down. When it comes to damn admission systems of American universities, um, uh, you know, my instinct is to burn it down. I'm skeptical that that's about to happen. Um, you know, my, my, my point prediction is that effectively we'll reinvent affirmative action in an even more convoluted way, in a way that pays even less attention towards academic achievement within those groups, uh, that gives even more attention to uh, factors like personal statements that, as I read through research, uh, correlate much more strongly with socioeconomic background and the ability to pay tutors to write those damn statements for you than, uh, than do even SAT scores and so on. Um, and, uh, and likely leave the rest of the system in place. So, you know, are we actually making a mountain out of a molehill in the sense that, you know, universities are going to find ways of largely circumnavigating this ruling? Or do, or do you think that the bite of the law is going to be stronger here than I'm imagining? Well, I, I think there will be a bite at least. So, you know, if you, my joke is that if you want a small amount of affirmative action, you should ban affirmative action because invariably they're going to do stuff to put these things in place. And then I think we're going to be looking at, you know, how heterogeneous the response is by universities to the extent that you end up going, you know, if you look at the UC system, what did they do when Prop 16 failed? So Prop 16 was trying to put racial preferences back in at, at California. It failed miserably with Trump on the ballot in California. If you were ever going to have a case for racial preferences, it would have been there. What did they do in reaction, in my view, in reaction to that? They'll say it wasn't because of that, but they got rid of the SAT score. To me, that's a disaster if we're going to move away, away from these things. But I think that there's windows of opportunity here, um, both because I think there is some pushback in recognizing that the non-academic factors favor the rich even more. We know that the SAT favors the rich. That's why we have this movement to ban the test because of cocaine and resources and all that. That's fine. But the problem is, is all those other things that they use favor the rich, you know, even more than that. Uh, preferences for sailing. In fact, my son worked for a, a Duke computer science professor for free. That looks great on your college application. And it was there because he didn't have to work because of our financial situation and because he had contacts. The test-based system, I think, is the, the fairer one. That's actually recognized in Korea. In Korea, my understanding is there's actually two ways to get into college. You have the, the test track and the non-test track. And the non-test track is known for favoring the, the rich. Uh, Korea can point to some other issues because I guess it's a pressure cooker. Uh, but the U.S. is such an outlier. Almost every other country, it's a test. And I think that the reason I think that that's so important is uh, trust in the system. You know, to me, it's a really bad look that every university wrote the same email to their students with platitude upon platitude about how 
you know, the ruling was not good, but we're still committed. And then the public approves of the decision. We're really, you know, the distrust in higher education has been falling and steps need to be taken to, to correct that. I think that's why you're going to see things like legacy admissions fall. So, 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 so there's two points here, right? Uh, the first is, uh, I think, an important one that uh, universities are mostly responsive to their stakeholders, which is their students, that lean progressive, their administrators, uh, their faculty members, that lean very progressive, and their administrators, who lean extremely progressive. Um, uh, you know, as well as the broader world of sort of highly educated people who graduated from the same set of colleges. Um, uh, but the long-term success of American higher education depends on public opinion in a much broader way. Um, you know, something like the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, one of the subjects of this lawsuit, is a public university that needs the support of state governors and state legislators um, and public funding. Um, Harvard University has a giant endowment and is less directly dependent on the state legislature, but Harvard, too, can only function if they continue to get a lot of uh, state research, public research funding, and of course, if their endowment remains untaxed. And so I think that university <laughs> leaders are really underestimating the long-term dangers to higher education in the United States if uh, opinion about universities become so polarized that half of the country just hates them and wants to take them down. And I think if they basically conspire to ignore this ruling and place their judgment above the judgment of whether or not they agree with that judgment. Um, uh, I, I, I think that is actually, uh, you know, at risk of, of undermining uh, trust in, in, in higher education in a significant way. The, the other point that I think is really interesting is, um, you know, the United States was founded in part as, uh, on the idea that we'll have state governments have laboratories in democracy. And you'd think that, you know, as rich uh, uh, and strong a system of, higher education as in the United States would lead to experiments in self-governance, that these institutions would go in different directions. And there's a little bit of that that can happen. I mean, I'm proud that uh, the president of my university, Johns Hopkins University, took the lead a number of years ago in uh, phasing out and abolishing uh, preferences for uh, legacy uh, students, preferences for students uh, whose parents or grandparents uh, went to the university and has not harmed uh, Johns Hopkins. Um, so certainly there's some uh, people who, who who are taking moral decisions and um, uh, uh, some context in which there's a little bit of divergence. But when you zoom out a little bit, what's striking is how extremely similar all of these different universities are. I mean, why doesn't a university that is placed 15th or 20th in the national ranking say, you know what, we're not going to keep competing with the top three schools for the exact same pool of students on the exact same criteria, we're going to go a different way and just have a test. And whoever aces the test gets it, right? I mean, other schools might say, we're really going to go whole hog in uh, you know, just caring about extracurriculars. And other school, I mean, you know, I have preferences between those different models, but, but you'd think that now would be a, a time at which universities and a strong leadership could say, hey, you know what? We're going to respond in this way and let's see how that goes. Uh, but I don't predict that that's going to happen because by and large on every dimension, uh, the top 25, 30 American schools are incredibly similar to each other. So I guess, you know, why is that? <laughs> and is there, is there any hope um, for going in a different direction? And if we have some university presidents listening to this, what would you encourage them to do? Um, you know, conso consonant with their values and their stakeholders, which direction should they go in uh, if, if they actually have the guts to engage in, in, in an experiment of self-government here? Well, to me, I think what universities fail to do continually is to use their data. It, what's remarkable is, you know, they have the experts on uh, this stuff and they don't use them because they're afraid of the lawsuits and such. And that really is damaging to students. Some hope for the heterogeneous response by different places would come from looking at COVID. Now, you could say that a lot of universities did the same COVID policy, but some didn't. Notre Dame's policy on COVID was way different from the Ivies. And what's sad about that 
is we don't actually know what the right answer was. I mean, maybe we think we know, but we don't have the data to say, well, Notre Dame's policy led to more or less mental health issues than the other policy. That should be like mandatory. And universities fundamentally, this is my pet peeve with universities, is that they fundamentally fail to use their data. Randomized roommates is a great example of this. Randomized roommates is great if you want to study how roommate characteristics affect uh, future things. Well, one, most of the time they don't study it. Sometimes they do. But two, they never implement any policies based on it. If you were actually using your data, you could actually figure out how to help your students. So to me, you, you should, what should end up happening is this, you know, competition for those top scoring black students is already fierce. Now it's going to get fiercer. If a university could say, look, with our data, we can show you we're actually really good for you in terms of your later life outcomes, in terms of your satisfaction. We know what professors actually are especially helpful for you. And we're going to make an effort to make that improve that experience. I think that could be huge. I feel like part of my reservations about affirmative action are that universities care about getting them in the door so that they, they look diverse, but then that's, they stop. Um, and I think that's, uh, it, because they defer to the faculty. That's why you end up with, with these majors that are able to bribe these students into the low paying fields, which I don't think is good uh, for the black students. Um, I realize as we're nearing the end of this conversation that I'm uh, guilty of something that I often complain about, which is that we over obsess about the world of highly to extremely selective colleges and universities because that's where you teach and went to and where I went and, 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 and teach. And so it's sort of, you know, always tempting to talk about your own backyard. When you're actually thinking about socioeconomic opportunity in the country um, and lifting the uh, prospects of minority students and black students in particular, uh, it, you know, what's probably more important is the quality of community colleges and less selective colleges and universities uh, where the huge bulk of students of any race um, uh, in the United States go. Um, uh, and in particular, lifting the experiences that students have in elementary school and middle school and in high school, uh, especially since minority students do continue to often uh, 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 be placed in schools that have many fewer resources and, 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 and that are therefore of lower quality. Uh, than uh, the schools that, um, you know, uh, white kids who are upper middle class um, uh, tend to go to. Um, just zooming out beyond the, the world of elite universities and perhaps even beyond the world of higher education as a whole, uh, you know, what are a few of the things that we can do to improve, uh, to increase the pool of highly skilled uh, 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 of highly academically prepared uh, uh, students who uh, uh, are available for admission at selective universities in 20 or 40 or 60 years. Yeah, I mean, my philosophy, I think, supported by the literature is the, the earlier, the better. You know, the, uh, to me, it's actually remarkable when we were having our kids, how much time was spent on preparing for the birth and not so much time spent on what are you going to do with this kid after afterwards? You know, those at first four years actually are incredibly important. When we get to the elementary school stage, we actually know what's fairly successful. These no excuse charter schools. I mean, Roland Fryer has got some great work on this. He was actually one of the few actually shows how to close these achievement gaps. He's now been read out of the profession, but uh, you know, he would be an amazing person to talk to on that front. Uh, those no excuse charter schools, you know, e even they are succumbing a bit to the wokeness. I mean, one of the systems, basically their motto was be nice, work hard. And they got rid of it, that motto, because it was deemed as not being sensitive to the racial things you have to overcome. But fundamentally, you know, those schools, by putting in the extra time and such, are able to make up for what's happened you know, for the disparities that, that, that happen early on. And I think that's actually the path 
so that we don't need the affirmative action in the first place. We have to address the skills gap up front. On the higher education side, you know, states could invest more money in the colleges where those students are going. You know, you could see a, a liberal state shift their funding model in response to the ruling so that we better target the college resources um, to the schools that minorities are actually attending. Peter, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me.